We've all seen the news of the devastating wildfires that affected California earlier this year. They followed the equally devastating, catastrophic floods that buffeted Western North Carolina after Hurricane Helene swept through the region. And if you're like me, you have friends or family who lost their homes or worse. Hundreds died, hundreds of thousands were displaced, and hundreds of billions of dollars in damages occurred. Now, these kinds of extreme weather events are becoming more visible, not just here, but around the world. Part of it is a function that more people live in areas that are exposed to these hazards along the coasts and in forested areas. And part of it is just simply that we can find out about them more easily in real time using social media. But part of it is also attributable to climate change, which is caused by pollution from burning fossil fuels. Climate change is contributing to what Texas Tech scientist Catherine Hayhoe calls global weirding. We're starting to see weird weather patterns all over the world that are somewhat outside the realm of known human experience. Now, we might think of these simply as disasters, but having worked in the US Department of Defense for two years as a senior climate advisor from 21 to 2023, and having studied these issues as a professor for more than 20 years, we can also say that these are national security risks. Now, you might be surprised to hear that the Department of Defense considers climate change to be a national security risk. How can that be? Well, let's back up for a second and understand how do we traditionally understand national security threats? Well, conventional national security risks are thought of as armed external attacks against the nation by a former by a foreign adversary. But what about problems like climate change and disease where there aren't other actors intentionally trying to do us harm? Can these be national security risks? Well, academics like me consider them as actorless threats that nonetheless rise to the level of security threats. In my view, what constitutes a national security problem is not whether someone is intentionally trying to harm us. Rather, it is the severity of the impact. If a problem can kill large numbers of people or create catastrophic damages, that elevates a run-of-the-mill public policy problem to a national security threat. So that's one reason why the Department of Defense considers climate change to be a national security risk. Another is that our military installations themselves are at risk. We have spent tens of billions of dollars in damage it, it, to, re, to recover and restore and rebuild military bases after extreme weather events, from Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida after Hurricane Michael, after uh, Hurricane uh, Florence swept through North Carolina, we had to do the same thing for Camp Lejeune, and after Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska experienced severe flooding, the same thing. Those tens of billions of dollars that we spent could have been avoided at least partially had we invested upfront in disaster risk reduction. Our militaries are also called upon to support civilian agencies like FEMA during disasters. Already, the National Guard has increased the number of personnel days that are dedicated to fighting wildfires from 14,000 in 2016 to 176,000 in 2021. Just recently during the California wildfires, 2,000 guardsmen and women were mobilized to support that effort. That's all well and good, but it takes them away from other important national security tasks. And it's not just here at home, it also happens internationally. So US Southern Command in 2020 supported disaster rescue and recovery efforts in Central America after Hurricane Eta swept through the region. Now, the concern in poor and poorly governed places is that those climate events will destabilize them, undermine fragile peace, contribute to violence and migration. I did a study with colleagues that found that drier and hotter than normal conditions in the 2010s was associated with higher outmigration from Central America to the United States, even when you take into account other risk factors like local violence. Indeed, if you accept that climate change is an existential risk that poses problems for the basic habitability of the planet, there is no greater risk over the long term. So why does this matter? Well, 
Problems that we label as national security receive extra attention and resources and even are eligible for emergency responses. The, the challenge though is if every problem is labeled a national security problem, the term starts to become meaningless. Arguably though, if a foreign adversary had bombed the Pacific Palisades in California earlier this year and caused this level of destruction, you can bet there would have been an incredible response from the US government and the US military. Now, you can't defeat climate change in battle. Addressing climate change isn't primarily the military's job. And if somehow it becomes perceived to be the responsibility of the US military, lots of other things have gone wrong. But fortunately, there are things that we can do at all levels to avoid these catastrophic damages. First, at the household level, you can now go on platforms like Zillow and look at the climate risk of a house before you buy it and decide, do I want to live there? And if you already live in a hazard prone area, you may have to climate proof your house by elevating it in flood prone areas or cutting down on fire prone materials around the house. Sadly, that might mean in some places moving away from the hazard itself. Already, people are finding it increasingly difficult in highly exposed areas to get home insurance. This underscores that it, addressing climate change will often exceed the capacity at the household level. We're going to need help from our cities, from our states, from our federal government. And unfortunately, the United States hasn't done very much in terms of adaptation or disaster risk reduction, and it needs to do more. By one account, $1 invested in disaster risk reduction can avoid $15 in recovery costs later on. Other countries have already had terrific success investing in disaster risk reduction. Indeed, relatively poor countries have been able to have success. Take the country of Bangladesh, which I've written about. Now, Bangladesh is a relatively poor country in South Asia. It has hundreds of millions of people that live in low elevation coastal zones. And even without climate change, Bangladesh knows extreme cyclones. As recently as the early 1990s, a single cyclone killed 140,000 people there. But now, when a severe cyclone presents itself, hardly anybody dies. Why is that? Well, the Bangladeshi government invested in forecasting so they can predict when the cyclones are coming. They invested in early warning systems so they can get the word out that a severe cyclone is coming. And they invested in purpose-built emergency shelters like these that allow people to get out of harm's way in times of need. Now, this underscores that these catastrophic effects of climate change are not inevitable. There are things that we can do to avoid them. Again, it starts with land use plans and better building codes. It includes good science and data on where the hazards are likely to emerge. It extends to forecasting an early warning system so we can tell people storms coming, right? And it also includes activation of emergency response plans so that people can get help when they need it. And sometimes that might mean military mobilization to help people uh, to avoid large scale loss of life and to get the emergency services they require. That should happen here at home and that should also happen internationally. I wanted to come back to a point uh, about Bangladesh. One reason why they were able to invest in these kinds of uh, successful plans is that they got some help from international donors like the United States through programs like USAID. A little bit of modest help has meant that hardly anybody dies anymore as a result of these extreme weather events. That's their success and that should be ours. Now I should note that these efforts are more likely to be successful in a world in which we're also moving to cleaner energy. That includes renewables, battery storage, nuclear power, electric vehicles, as fast as we can. That's the hopeful promise of investments in clean energy and adaptation 
that'll make us safer, more secure. It's a proactive approach to national security that one I intend to support in my personal and professional life going forward. Thanks so much.